Get ready for the latest NFL info you need to know. NFL Insider starts now. Well, perhaps the most debated, discussed, and dissected topic of the last four months comes to a conclusion very soon. <laughs> Deflate Gate, of course, here with Adam Schefter, Jarrett Bell, Mark Dominic. I'm Susie Kalber. Adam, let's start right there. You've been saying since yeah. this morning you believe discipline is imminent. So what are you hearing right well, now? Well, imminent means maybe today, maybe tomorrow, certainly very soon. I would think within the next 24 hours we'll have something. If you go back to last week when the Wells report initially was released, we said at that time that it would be days. Well, days have come and days have gone. And the NFL is getting ready to announce its findings and hand out its discipline. And there you see the timeline from last week and some of the events. And I believe the league is ready. And I believe the league is close to, if not having, a decision. And we should be hearing about it at some point either later today, maybe tomorrow, but certainly not very long from now. Yeah, definitely by the middle of the week, Adam. And I think we're going to be looking at all three of these buckets, if you, if you will, a suspension for Tom Brady, a big fine for the Patriots, and some kind of hit on the draft for the Patriots for next year. So I think they're going to get hard, get, get hit uh, significantly. Yeah, and I think when you look at this comparatively to what you saw with the Atlanta Falcons, the same kind of process, exactly what Jared's talking about, you can apply this the same way. The Falcons pumped in crowd noise. I mean, that's obviously a competitive advantage. You could look at it the same way as what the Patriots in the Ted Wells investigation report shows, and that's why you could see exactly what you're saying, a fine, a suspension, and obviously a draft pick. And if you look at the way Troy Vincent has handled some of the on-field violations, he's actually been consistent to a degree in terms of meeting out that punishment. And I think that the Falcons and the Browns cases are really templates for what we can expect yeah. with the Patriots. And I think there's a strong feeling in the league office among some that what Tom Brady did in the Wells report is akin to taking a performance-enhancing drug without taking the performance-enhancing drug because it enabled them in the eyes of the Wells report to perhaps have an improved performance. Now, again, some will argue the evidence there, but I think that's the feeling of some people within the league. And that's why I think we're talking about anywhere from two to four games. That's the range you seem to hear and think about when you talk to people. Two to four games for Brady, somewhere in the range. It's going to be very interesting to see what and the league decides. And, and no matter what the league decides, there's going to be a large segment of people that's very unhappy with the decision. Well, you mentioned Troy Vincent. Who really is responsible for handing down the discipline here? It's, it's on Troy Vincent, but when you, you look at it from a league standpoint, obviously Roger Goodell is <laughs> the sheriff in the NFL office, so nothing happens without Roger Goodell having his input in it. And Jeff Pass, if you remember when the NFL uh, commissioned the Wells report, Pass was the key person from the league office that worked in terms of uh, the communication with the league office and, and the Wells office. Yeah, I think there's five names you got to think about the league office. Obviously, Commissioner Goodell, Jeff Pash, Dave Gardy, who's also along with Troy Vincent and Peter Rucco. Those are the five guys I bet that are getting together deciding what the punishment is. And when you say a lot of people won't be happy about it, maybe that's because the language in the Wells report, too, is probable. You know, there, more there probable is more than probable than not. Than not. And then, again, it's hard to say exactly that he did do it or he didn't do it. And there are people that love the Patriots and there are people that hate the Patriots. So the people that love the Patriots, if it's a light of suspension, maybe they'll be pleased and vice versa. But again, there's no way that everybody's going to come away pleased with this decision, which is why it's such a difficult decision for the commissioner and the other people involved in it, because it's such a polarizing issue. One thing quickly that resonates with me is when you see in a Wells report where it says the referee, Walt Anderson, has been in his position for 19 years and never before has he ever had a case where they lost the track of the footballs before the game. Not just any game, by the way, the AFC championship game. And it also comes down to, to what's the punishment really all about. Is it about withholding information, lack of cooperation, all of those things? Well, I think the league is upset and disappointed that, in its eyes, Tom Brady did not come forward with emails, with his text messages. But then again, you could say to the flip side of that, that they have the text message records of everyone else in the Patriots organization. So if Tom Brady texted Jim McNally or he texted John Ustremski or he texted Bill Belichick or Nick Casario, there's a record of that. They've seen all the texts that have come into those phones from Tom Brady. He didn't give over his records, but again, the league had access to it, but that's not enough in the league's eyes. Many different sides to this, so let's bring in Josina Anderson. 
Josina is with us as well today. Mm -hmm. So number one, Josina, how do people in the league feel about the talk of using the PED policy with regards to cheating and a four game suspension as a baseline for punishment? Well, Susie, a league source that I talked to thought that the use of the PED policy for coming up with some sort of baseline for discipline um, was not exactly equivalent, but understandable when you're factoring the cheating questions and considerations surrounding the Tom Brady case, just with regards of the presumption of at least a minimum of a four game suspension when applying the PED policy. And that league source said, quote, people are talking about the automatic four game suspension for a PED, but that's actually more unclear now because our PED discipline is more tiered now as of 2014. In the old policy, it was a straight four game, eight, and then banishment, no matter what it was. Now there are more subtleties for establishing a positive result. And just to illuminate that more, now you can get a two game suspension for producing a dilute sample. If you have a positive result for Adderall in the off season, you're actually directed to the substance of abuse program as opposed to the automatic four. If you have that same positive of Adderall during the season or a possible six game, if there is a, a banned um, substances mixed with the dilute sample. So they just wanted to underline the nuances that are actually applied there. And they actually thought it was more apt to consider uh, the use of stick them when it comes to mechanical violations with regards to um, competitive violations as opposed to something that's ingested that's biological. And the other area that we all just discussed that a lot has been made of Tom Brady not turning over his cell phone. Mm -hmm. How are NFLPA reps reacting to Ted Wells investigation, including requests to surrender personal records? Well, yeah, definitely not good. I talked to uh, NFLPA executive committee member Lorenzo Alexander, who obviously was dismayed by uh, the request possibly for uh, phone records and things like that, although we know that Tom Brady could have just produced the messages within the scope of the investigation. But Lorenzo said, quote, I think not turning over text messages should not have had any bearing on Tom Brady's livelihood with respect to playing and being paid by the NFL. At the end of the day, I know I'm not going to incriminate myself especially if I don't have to, where should the line be drawn? And the other thing that Lorenzo wanted to just say is that regardless of the punishment that we are anticipating, per Adam Schefter's report, that they will continue to support Tom Brady and they want him to know that they have his back. Susie? Okay. Josina will be with us throughout the show. Adam, I know you kind of want to jump in on one well, of the things. One thing that, that we were talking about, we've seen something like this happen before. In a similar case, Brett Favre asked to turn over his cell phone right. when he was involved with a woman New York Jets employee, and he declined to do it. And that was in December of 2010, roughly. The league wound up fining him $50,000. So if we're going to talk precedent here, that would seem to be a precedent if that's what upsets the league. A similarly high-statured quarterback refusing to turn over his cell phone records when requested. And in that particular case, it resulted in a $50,000 fine for Brett Favre. And, Mark, you've been through an investigation I'm I, can, I, I, I can dial right into what you're talking about. I've been through one of these investigations before. We had a situation during the lockout where our coach, Coach Raheem Morris at the time, was said that he was talking to players all the time, and we were requested to turn over the phone records, which was over at, at some point through the process. I was so frustrated with the process, I said, I'm done. I'm done giving you guys. You had all this information. You found nothing so far. They said, we want another phone, 1,000 phone records. I wouldn't do it. And I think if you've ever seen the movie The Firm, they strongly encourage, well, the league office strongly encouraged the phone records to a fine, exactly what Adam Schefter just reported about, you know, with Brett Favre. And we had a big fine come with. Suddenly the phone records appeared and the fine kind of disappeared. So they are strongly encouraging. That's a serious situation up there. They take that as an offense of guilt. Mm-hmm. Oh. Penalty gets tougher. You don't cooperate. That's going to factor into the final analysis when it comes to discipline. Okay. We'll be on top, obviously, of any breaking news we are here up until nfl live at four eastern so keep it right here on espn and some additional context other teams were punished earlier this offseason including the browns they saw gm ray farmer suspended four games for textgate the falcons forfeited a late round pick for pumping in crowd noise and the jets were fined a hundred thousand dollars for tampering with darrell Rivas. geico presents strange savings stories Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. 
The first non-quarterback selected in the draft saw his season end before it began. Jags rookie Dante Fowler Jr., the third overall pick, will miss his entire rookie season after suffering a torn ACL in his left knee on Friday during the team's first practice of its rookie minicamp. Fowler injured, rushing the passer during 11-on-11 drills. I played it uh, on my left, my left leg a little bit, uh, over-exaggerated a little bit, and my, uh, my weight shifted one way, and my foot got caught in the dirt. So, yeah, it, uh, you know, it was a little nasty feeling. In the future, a year now from now, we'll be all smiling again, talking about, you know, me sacking people, so it'll be fine. Fowler wasn't the only rookie to suffer a season-ending injury at rookie minicamp this year. On Saturday, Broncos tight end Jeff Hireman tore his ACL. He was a third-round pick out of Ohio State. Some minor injuries of note also as Panthers top picks Shaq Thompson and Devin Funches left minicamp on Friday. So we know that each team, each head coach has a different philosophy of how to indoctrinate the rookies into their program. What's too much? Well, for me personally, I lived this on the wrong way. I, I learned a tough lesson back in 2010 with a young player named Brian Price who we just drafted out of UCLA defensive tackle. Had a lot of potential and promise in that first rookie minicamp. He tore basically the hamstring off the bone. And in the end of the day, we had to drill drills to put it, reattach both hamstrings into his bone. And he never really recovered as a football player from that. And it was really sad. And what that taught me is from that point going forward, our draft picks that we actually selected weren't allowed in team drills. I never allowed them in nine on seven, seven on seven, team, anything. They could have individual time. And I wanted them for two things. One, I didn't want a young player that was in the organization that's trying to make the team that doesn't have a contract to accidentally do something where he's trying to impress a coach and he gets a guy hurt. And number two, I want to make sure they're in the right type of football shape to be able to do this drills this fast because I want to put them with my strength and conditioning coach for a couple weeks before we jump into OTAs and make sure they're up to speed where they need to go. So it's unfortunate. I've lived the same road, and it's, it's, it's crumbling for Jacksonville. They're in combine shape, not football shape. That's right. Big oh, difference. Oh, great point. Yeah, because you go from conditioning – to all of a sudden competing. Mm -hmm. Now, some people may wonder whether or not the NFLPA will initiate a grievance because if you saw the injury occur on film, he was engaged with the offensive lineman. But from my understanding of the way the CBA reads, there's not supposed to be live contact. So now you have to have an interpretation of what's live, what's not. The, the CBA allows you to, to have some type of contact in these 11 on 11 type situations as long as it's not live. And live contact usually means full speed, 100 miles an hour, tackling to the ground. I don't think they were in that type of situation. To Mark's point, these players sometimes are trying to impress their coaches. And you have to keep in mind they haven't been doing football drills and to a large extent, they've been traveling the country, visiting teams for a month, right? Not doing yep. much of anything, then getting drafted, then celebrating their selection, as they should, the achievement of a lifelong goal. And so they go in there, and they're not in great football shape. And so when you are running drills like that, and it's easy to say post facto now. Like, yep. you would never be saying this if he didn't get hurt. But now that he has, it's easy to say sometimes these guys are just not ready to go at that speed that early on in that type of setting. Yeah, one, one footnote to Fowler. He is the first top three pick in the NFL to, well, now miss the season since Kajana Carter mm. in 1995. But if you, you saw just a little snippet of Fowler talking there, maybe a little bit of a smile on his face, the Jags were so impressed of how positive he is, just his spirit, that he looked at this as, all right, an opportunity to get my body even bigger, stronger, Come back even better. It's, a, it's the best attitude to adopt, but on another hand, you could also say he's so young, he doesn't even know what's ahead oh, and the damage he's done to his knee. So that's the more realistic approach, but I applaud him for his optimism and his spirit there, and that's great, and hopefully he can continue to maintain that going forward. Yeah, and if you're a Jags fan, you're, you're probably saying, why us? <laughs> We've had <laughs> so much drama and so many setbacks. Uh, here's another one. Well, right, and it's been a rough road for the top defender and taken off the board in each of the last four drafts. Those players, Fowler, Jadevian Clowney, Deion Jordan, and Morris Claiborne, are all either going to miss the 2015 season or are coming off a season-ending injury. And none of those players have experienced much NFL success. I'm Doug Kazarian. On the latest NBA Lockdown podcast, Amin El Hassan and I talk about what could have been a fatal mistake for David Blatt and debate if the Grizzlies or Clippers series lead is more surprising. Check it out at ESPN.com slash PodCenter. With the likelihood of a Tom Brady suspension coming down soon, worth mentioning, success recent players have had in appealing their high-visibility cases 
Adrian Peterson was recently reinstated, getting taken off the exempt list after he appealed his indefinite suspension. Ray Rice was reinstated in late November after his appeal. And all four Saints players suspended in the 2012 for the Bounty Gate scandal had their suspensions vacated after a lengthy back and forth. So precedent has been set, shortened suspensions off the appeal process. How do we anticipate this going down? Well, I think the first thing you're going to see is you're going to see the commissioner come down hard. Mm -hmm. I think when this with ruling comes down, look, the one thing when you look at the Ray Rice case, he said, I got it wrong. Mm -hmm. He's not going to mess up again. He's not going to come out with a suspension that's soft in any case for any players going forward because it can always be susp- it can always be appealed and it can be lowered. And so I think when you're going to see Roger Goodell and the league office come down with a suspension, I would err to the side that's going to be heavier than you expect and let the, let the process take place because I think that's the way the commissioner wants it to be set now. And this is a different league right now. The league, I yes. think, going forward is always going to err to the side of being heavy on its discipline. Better in the league's eyes to be too heavy than to be too light. When it went too light before... That didn't work out very well for the league. It came under massive criticism. And so that is something that is going to be in the league's thought process whenever it's making a decision like the one that it's about to make right now. But there seems to be as much focus on this one as any recent decision. And I don't see any reason why they're going to lighten up right now. We'll see. Well, I mean, you went through the whole process of the Ted Wells investigation and producing that report and adding the weight to that that you think comes from that with a competitive violation. Yeah. And then also what you want to add to that with a non-cooperation and the lack of compliance there and what you're going to do with that as far as considering it conduct detrimental. And, and how about how far back this goes? You know, I mean, I think we're thinking of this as this is about the AFC championship game. Right. But maybe is there more to it? Well, I talked to a league source who, again, was using the application of the PED policy as an example when it comes to a violation and really thinking, is the AFC championship game really the only time that this occurred? Or do we have a common sense notion that this occurred outside of that? And and they said, well, think about it. When someone tests positive for steroids, do we think that that's just the first time we did it? No, but we have to go with what's in front of us as far as a positive result, not what's in the past. We can imply, apply enhanced testing, but not enhanced punishment. Should Brady lose or get suspended here? I'm sure that that will start the appeal process. Okay. And now, time for a little ESPN Insider's Notebook. And we'll start with Mark, your reaction to the Patriots releasing Kyle Arrington, who, by the way, led the NFL in interceptions in 2011 with seven. Yeah, no, you know, it's a tough situation there with New England when you sit there and look about the fact that Darrell Revis is gone, Browner's gone, now Arrington's gone. But you got to sit there and say a couple things. Number one with Arrington, they can't agree to a new deal, but they certainly need to let him test the market for at least 24 to 40 hours before they can start contract negotiations to possibly bring him back. But I think it speaks higher to Malcolm Butler, how they feel about him going forward, certainly Logan Ryan. And remember, Devin McCourty can work either the corner or safety position. So I think they're a little better off than people think. Josina, another cornerback in the news, Orlando Skandrick at the Dallas Cowboys. What's the latest on his contract? Well, still hasn't showed up for the off-season conditioning program. And the quandary there is that on a rating list like Pro Football Focus, he's ranked as a top 10 corner, but just making one. $1.5 million this year, although he has a $3 million APY. But with the context of that, you're looking at Buster Screen, who is getting $6.5 million in cash this year, ranked 82nd on the same list. Bryce McCain making $3.5 million this year, ranked 65th. Sharice Wright, $3 million, ranked 105. So still waiting for some clarity, especially with our Brandon Carr situation, who's also making $8 million. All right, Jared, what did you learn from covering Janus Winston in the draft process that led up to him becoming the number one pick? Yeah, I spent some time with him before the draft in his hometown in Bessemer, Alabama, and then went to Tampa, and he made a good first impression. I think one of the things that I picked up on him is how engaging he is in smaller settings, including the barbershop where I ran into him the day before the draft. (laughs) Now, of course, all of that's good, and he went to the uh, the, the rookie minicamp early to actually meet his teammates to greet them. That showed a little bit of leadership, and I think that's something that is going to bode well for him. He spoke very well of the veterans and things like that. But, of course, what happens on the field, learning that playbook, learning the language, processing defenses, that's where it's really going to come down to. I thought his haircut looked remarkably similar to yours. I must say that. (laughs) Very similar. Very similar.